Plain Varsity, representing your community, chasing league and state titles. This is School Sports, a uniquely American experience dating back more than a century. But this is School Sports 2, student-led clubs, mixed gender teams, intramurals, adaptive sports, fun activities introduced through PE and community partnerships. Pick up play at school facilities, that counts as well. With sports, a great high school offers something for all students. Interscholastic competition, but so much more. It's a school that understands the educational and physical benefits that flow to students whose bodies are in motion, and that sports are the best venue to develop social and emotional skills. It's hard to teach that in biology. It's hard to teach that in algebra. It's the perfect place to teach that, you know, on the soccer field or the, the basketball court or the football field or whatever, whatever it might be. It's the, perfect, it's the perfect practice field for those skills. For two years, the Aspen Institute conducted a national search to find the most innovative schools through its Project Play initiative that helps build healthy children and communities through sports. Our founding partners in the Reimagining School Sports series, Adidas and Box, the Dick Sporting Goods Foundation, and Hospital for Special Surgery distributed $160,000 in awards to the winning schools. Schools come in many types and sizes, from large to small, urban to rural, private to charter. So we produced eight reports with data and insights that principals and leaders could put to use in the schools where they work. Then we packaged the best of the ideas we discovered into a playbook that could be used anywhere. Sport for All, Play for Life, a playbook to develop every student through sports, offers eight strategies to both improve the sports experience for athletes and get more students playing. It's a roadmap to make school sports more accessible, more equitable, and more student-centered. It's a bid to unlock the full potential of school sports to change lives and our communities. We know the research on the value of young people playing sports. They simply do better in life. But fewer than four in 10 students play in high school, even with the progress made by Title IX with girls. And now, physical inactivity rates are rising. That's why we at the Dick Sporting Goods Foundation support this work. Students emerge from high school with healthy living habits for life, or they don't. They move into adulthood with a love of sport and fitness, or with bodies that limit their ability to move well and often. At HSS, we want to help schools develop ideas and opportunities that prevent injuries and support the long-term health of student athletes. We encourage high schools to examine their sports and activities offerings and take this opportunity to reach as many students as possible in new ways. A reimagined school sports model that keeps high school education-based sports and activities at its core is a proven roadmap for success. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the launch event for our School Sports Playbook. I'm Tom Ferry, Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Sports and Society Program and co-author on the Playbook with Editorial Director John Solomon. We're proud of this resource and grateful to our partners and the 66 members of our advisory group who helped us develop this framework. Among them, Carissa Niehoff, CEO of the National Federation of State High School Associations, the governing bodies for interscholastic sports in each state. Welcome, Carissa. Uh, tell me, why is now the time to reimagine school sports in America? Well, I think um, we are absolutely poised to do this work and, and the Aspen Institute has led through great research and a national scouring of best practices out there and really listening to student voice. Um, the statistics around student wellness are not what we want them to be. 
At the same time, we know that the ecosystem of sport, physical activity, and play are, are it's probably the first and foremost, the best ecosystem to offer something for every child, to engage them in experiences that ultimately lead to growth and development that's going to serve them throughout their lives. Now's the time. Gotcha. I mean, our data show that just 39% of students in high school play sports. I mean, that number has stagnated over the past couple of decades, even as the research has grown about the educational, the physical, and the mental benefits of being physically active and playing sports. Why have the rates stagnated? Well, there are a number of reasons, Tom. That's a great question. Um, there are first and foremost resource issues in a lot of our schools. Um, they may not simply have the funds to add additional programs, additional sports, or intramural programs. There may be facility challenges, especially in our urban environments where um, you have the, a demographic congestion there and kids just can't get access to facilities. And then finally, we're realizing that we have a human capacity crisis. We don't have enough adults in leadership roles to volunteer or even get paid a little bit of a stipend to teach, coach, offer some programming. So, and, and the final thing I would say is we need, we've kind of let our collaborative relationships fall by the wayside a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we need to re-engage with other sport entities in our communities so that we can address some of these collective problems. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, more broadly, what, what, what's the solution? Um, you've talked about a, a something for all model. What do you mean by yeah, that? I, yes. And I think that's almost a campaign slogan that we all have to embrace. Mm -hmm. And we have to in, infuse the amount of energy at a national level, at a state level, at a community level, that really is a heartfelt, deep commitment, unwavering commitment to making sure that each of our children is engaged in sport and play. Um, one of the things that we have to do is really look again with a perspective that is about the larger ecosystem. It can't be just schools. It can't be parks and rec separate from schools. We've got to have the collective conversation to make an exponentially greater effort toward policy change, toward advocacy for uh, resources and funding, grant programs, uh, immediate improvement of facilities and opportunity offerings. And of course, uh, looking at the great work that the Aspen Institute is doing with research to help guide the relative impact that we're making and where our gaps are. So a number of things need to drive the solution that is a collective commitment to having every child connected. Yeah. So, we, you know, I really like this idea of something for all. What we did is we called it a student-centered model. Maybe we can bring up the slide that shows what we're talking about here. Um, so, I mean, the main, main argument here is, is, is that, you know, don't just offer a limited menu of traditional sports, hold your tryouts, and then maybe shrug your shoulders at the students who don't make it or don't have a school team to play for. I mean, it's really an argument for what the student wants. Really understand at an individual level as best as you can, and then organize your efforts from there. Connect, you know, either connect or provide experiences. I mean, does that sound right to you? Does this model resonate? Absolutely. If we are committed for having every student engaged in some form of activity or program, um, we absolutely have to be hearing from them. Um, it's no uh, unusual practice for schools to survey kids to see where their interests might be from a club perspective. Um, also a very important co-curricular experience, but um, we've, we've sort of slipped away from a focus on intramural programming, connection with outside venues and entities that might offer a unique experience for kids, ski slopes, uh, canoe kayak programs, other facilities in our communities that might have an opportunity and availability for kids to connect through adult leadership at their schools. Kids will tell us what their interests are and what they might be interested in doing. Obviously, interscholastic athletics is a fundamental piece of our sport ecosystem, the fabric of, um, as you mentioned in the intro, the United States and, and to some degree Canada. Um, who do school sports through schools as opposed to the European model. So interscholastic athletics will always be healthy and central to program offerings, but we really need to get at the other 
uh, 60% and 70% of kids, uh, depending on your programming, that really are not engaged with some form of activity. So starting with the student voice, engaging the adult leadership within the larger community. Um, and I think we're on our way to identifying where efforts need to be applied and resources need to be allocated. Mm -hmm. You know, institutions are, they're hard to change. And the, and the institution of high school sports has been around for a hundred years. And really the current model has been around for about 50 years or so. How hard will it be for school leaders to change their behavior? I mean, what will it take for them to embrace this, this broader call to action in the playbook and implement at least some of these ideas, especially in the wake of COVID and all the challenges that they've faced over the past couple of years? Yeah, I, and that's a great question, Tom. I think that school leaders that are informed as to the value of uh, co-curricular involvement like sport, um, I think many of them probably were high school student athletes um, themselves. They know that it matters. The research continues to so tell the story about the impact of participation on growth and development uh, throughout one, one's life. We also know that high school is often the last stop in terms of organized involvement in sport. Um, 96, 97% of our high school kids cease interscholastic competition at, after high school. So the research, the statistics are, are apparent, they're in front of us. I think the, the life of school administrators is one that's very consumed, necessarily so, with an emphasis on academic programming, um, accountability measures that are very important to measure um, the industry standard, if you will, for how we offer the academic programming for kids. And I think within that finite school day and within the finite sort of um, bandwidth that we have going on in, a, in our brains and in our program efforts, um, school sports and murals sometimes um, have to take sort of a, a back seat in terms of focus. I, I think it's going to need um, a collective, again, a collective embrace, um, sort of a, a reset button on where these kinds of programs need to fit the priority they need to take. And it has to be bigger than just interscholastic sport. Um, administrators know that perhaps the most volatile thing that will be picked up in the media is sport, um, competitive sport. But one of the most joyful things that we fail to talk about enough is the club, the intramural, the unified sport opportunity. There's nothing better for culture and climate in a school than a unified sports program. So we, we need to pay attention to the high profile things that happen as administrators, but we also need to raise the importance, the attention that we pay to the joy and the growth that happens for all of the other kids through all of those other programs. Um, and that's a collective effort through messaging. We need to support our administrators um, as they try to do this. Yep. Now, I mean, the, the National Fed, the, the NFHS, the organization that you are the CEO of, I mean, what, what, what do you plan to do in, in, in support of these ideas? Right? I mean, you're a federated structure, and yet you sit on top of, I would argue, the most significant sport uh, ecosystem in our country, youth professional. I mean, you, you have the most number of bodies in your system, but you don't have necessarily control over, over the policies that, that flow underneath. So how, how can the NFHS be uh, useful uh, in advancing these, this, these ideas? That's, you're absolutely right in describing our federated structure by design. Um, we, we can first and foremost be a national leader in a number of ways. Um, collaboration with other entities is incredibly important. So working with the Aspen Institute, working with our national governing bodies in sport that are now turning their attention to a healthy athlete development experience, age and stage, education of coaches. We have an online learning platform that has almost 90 courses now that are available for coaches, administrators, parents, students themselves, um, anyone interested in the ecosystem at large. And we also, by the way, are the national leader for performing arts. So speech, debate, music, and theater that are also overseen by about half of our state interscholastic associations um, who do sport. So all of that second half of the school day is something that we can lead. We can be the lead advocate, the lead collaborator, 
providing educational resources, um, working with groups like yourself around what the research is telling us. We have a foundation that is offering millions of dollars right now as we speak for risk minimization strategies in high schools across the country. We have an NFHS network, an online streaming platform that is literally serving nearly 20,000 high schools. We can use those communication platforms for advocacy efforts and messaging all of the important information about engagement. Um, but again, it's collaborative, it's intentional, it's um, out front with advocacy efforts, connecting the people who do the work on the ground, the ADs, the coaches, the teachers, the administrators, and ultimately the schools, the state associations, and then national organizations. If we can be that catalyst and the lead provider, the lead voice, um, we are absolutely committed to that. Um, and, and we are enjoying those efforts right now, full steam ahead to bring the playbook to fruition. Great. In 30 seconds, we got about uh, left here. What's your blue sky vision? What's possible for schools in a nutshell that embrace these ideas and the general philosophy uh, in this framework? Well, what's possible for schools if they embrace and implement as much as possible through collaborative work in their community, they're going to see happier, more engaged students, students who will ultimately be more academically successful, um, more engaged in the life of the school and subsequently the life in the communities. We know that I had a mentor once who said, um, if students have nothing to do, they're not going to be doing nothing. So we've got to give them something productive to do. And I think if schools are committed to doing that, they're going to find more productive, successful kids, tremendous culture, tremendous spirit, um, belonging within the school. And that just carries over to every element of our young people's lives. Terrific. Well, thank you, Carissa, for your contributions to this project again. And we look forward to working with you to help school sports leaders implement, uh, implement that. Thank you, Tom. Congratulations. I look forward to our work together. Likewise. Okay. So now let's dig into the playbook. The eight, eight, eight strategies or plays aggregated from our two years of research that we hope school leaders find useful. Not a deep dive on any play, just a quick overview with brief conversation with a member of our advisory group or others who can help you understand the opportunity. So play number one, align school sports with the school mission. Let's start with the end in mind. What's the purpose of school sports? It's not always clear. We see words like excellence or character or commitment painted on the walls of gyms, but what do they really mean? And how do these ideals map to the larger educational mission of a school and its responsibility to serve all students. In the absence of that level of clarity, it's easy for coaches to assume that their job is to win game, win championships, job one. Winning is fine, but really job one is developing students. So we encourage principals and athletic directors to align the mission of school sports with the mission of the school create that alignment in conversation with all key stakeholders from coaches to parents to faculty and build consensus about what you aim to achieve. Eli Wolf is director of the Power of Sport Lab and an advisor on our school sports project. Welcome, Eli. What is the value in your, uh, in your assessment of this strategy? Well, this is really critical, really essential to provide that, again, going back to the student-centered, and I would also say human-centered. You know, it's really about that human piece. Um, and also in terms of the educational um, priority, the bringing the educational piece into this. And I guess the third piece would be really centering uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation. And so I feel like by having the mission at the core, aligning it, it really drives uh, drives really visibility to this. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit more. How would mission statements, uh, if, if they were aligned, uh, uh, create more inclusion for students, uh, in particular with, uh, with with disabilities? I mean, you, you, you've done an tremendous work in this space. I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to that. Well, really, the, the mission statement is that that opportunity to really highlight inclusion it's really that chance, and we're seeing it across the board, organizations around the country, um, 
you know, schools, universities, all sorts of organizations are starting to bring that forward, bringing in the bring this forward around inclusion. But I think part of it is to really be explicit. So really being explicit about those populations that may have been on the margins, whether it's around gender, around sexual orientation, around disability. And so by bringing disability into those conversations, into the mission, then it allows a place for individuals with disabilities or other populations to be visible, to be heard, to have a, to have a point of reference. And so that, that's, I think, why the mission is so central to this conversation. Yeah. How do we make sure, like, how do, how do we enforce a mission statement, right? How do we make sure the schools actually follow through and these just aren't words that sit on a piece of paper or in someone's inbox or, or otherwise? Any ideas? I mean, ultimately, it's about, you know, the voices. It's about the people, um, the students. It's about the families. It's about the the administration itself it's about bringing the visibility making it a priority putting it in around the institution putting it on emails you know putting it in a place that it's really seen and, and really putting value to that and really making it livable and i also think the element of of you know reporting so having an annual check-in having a place where you're really looking at across the state you know what are schools doing up against each other and giving that a chance. And then also in the backdrop, you have the Title IX, you have the um, Rehab Act, you have states that have done, I know you will hear about Maryland a little bit later, but we'll, you know, different places that have different examples. Um, but I think part of it is to bring that visibility forward and, and really, really making that a priority. So it's not just words on the paper, but you're really making it livable. Yeah, you know, designing commitments and actions that align with the mission. Well, terrific. Well, thank you, Eli, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. So now let's talk about play number two, which is understand your student population. You know, sport interest surveys can help schools demonstrate compliance with Title IX. For decades, schools have used them to show the U.S. Department of Education that their school is meeting the interests and abilities of the underrepresented sex girls. They can be a powerful tool if utilized. Our recommendation is conduct student interest surveys on an annual basis and bolster them with questions that tease out insights that include but are not limited to gender interests. Allow analysis by disability, race or ethnicity, and grade level. Ask about the, uh, about the sports that students play, that they want to play, and other health and fitness activities. Ask why they play and why they don't. Gathering those insights offers a clear path on how any school can grow and improve its sports offerings. Paolo Di Maria is president and CEO of the National Association of State Boards of Education, another organization that sat on our advisory group. Welcome, Paolo. Good to be with you, Tom. What is the value in your mind of surveying students and this specific idea of expanding what we learn about students? Yeah, I mean, I think both your previous speakers have made the wonderful point that, you know, students are at the focus of this. And so many times we in the education system, we're designed to serve students and yet we don't listen to that student voice nearly enough. And so this play is right in, in, that, in that sweet spot to say, look, students know what's going on. They know what they like. They know what's happening in the world, oftentimes more so than adults do. And so what better way to, to figure out how you can develop your programs and programs that will interest and engage them than by asking them. Um, I recently noted that the Ohio High School Athletic Association approved two new sports uh, as emerging sports. One was girls wrestling and the other was boys volleyball. And you got to believe at some point those two things started by a group of students coming together saying, hey, we want to do this, finding an advisor and, 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 and just think of the benefit and advantages that have emerged from that. So we will always be surprised and get, gain great insight if we ask students, what their interests are. And if we watch and observe and see what they're doing on the playgrounds and in their in their rec centers and so forth and so on, because that will give us keen insight to designing programs that they'll love and enjoy. Mm -hmm. So how do how to encourage schools to adopt the strategy to actually survey students? I mean, given, uh, you know, some reluctance that we've seen uh, with Title IX student interest surveys are not always deployed. 
Sure. I, I mean, I think it goes back to what, what the play number one, which is in, integrated into mission, right? If you really have a strong belief that these kinds of activities are integral and fundamental to the educational experience, um, then, then the concept of asking students, it's, it doesn't become just a compliance exercise. It becomes something that has meaning. You have to go into it saying, I'm going to listen and hear and then act on what I hear in order to help create the conditions for students to be successful. And, and I think we need more and more people to think of it from that perspective rather than necessarily a compliance exercise because the satisfaction that will come in identifying sports that kids really want to in, be involved in. And your video at the front end showed a number of, you know, sort of things that one doesn't normally think of, uh, you know, frisbee golf, ping pong, um, you know, some of the martial arts, uh, things like bocce, you know, all, all sorts of things that kids are tuned into and understand, but that never rise to the radar screen. And until you ask them and listen to them uh, and hear, hey, here's something, and it won't take that big an investment. And yeah, we can find an advisor to, to help nurture it and, and, and create it or work in partnership with some of our other uh, community organizations, like Carissa said. Uh, you, can, you, you can create opportunities for students to feel engaged, feel like they belong, that will enhance their overall well-being and be a, an integral part of the educational experience. Is there anything that local school districts can do or even the U.S. Department of Education? I mean, maybe with the local school districts, you know, including these sort of, you know, the student surveys and the local school wellness policy or, or the, you know, U.S. Department of Education creating or endorsing a survey instrument that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I School surveys students about lots of different things. So, you know, making a deliberate effort to incorporate this, but I think also finding supplemental ways, you know, focus groups, talking to kids, engaging with the kids that maybe don't seem to be active and really probing into, you know, what what things interest them. And then, and I think also like watching and engaging with community partners about what's what's happening out there on the on the playgrounds or in the in the rec centers that might be of interest that the school could grab onto or partner with in that interest of creating a much more robust sport you know uh, um, inventory uh, for their own students so yeah I, I think I think part of it is all of us encouraging it but the, the schools have to believe in the value and then take the action necessary and we can help elevate why it's so important to that student well-being and the student experience all right, in maybe 15 seconds or less, anything state boards can do, boards of education? Sure, I mean, right now, a key priority for state boards is the, is the whole student wellness, student well-being um, agenda. And, and this fits so beautifully into that because part of that agenda is helping students to feel safe, helping students to feel engaged, helping students to have that sense of belonging. Sh making sure that every student has a caring adult and the adults that work in sports are often that caring adult that so many of us have fond memories about that we could go to with our challenges those adults can also be on the on the front lines of uh, you know establishing whether you know maybe a student is going through a struggle and a school counselor you know uh, can be can be tipped off that hey maybe somebody needs to talk to this child a little bit because it seems like they're struggling helping address some of their some of their needs so if you build it in as part of the infrastructure and state boards in elevating all those activities that deal with student wellness and success can um, can can play a pivotal role along with state education agencies and other state leadership. Great. Well, thank you for joining us, Paolo. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. It's a great all product. Right. I look forward to working with you. All right. Likewise. Uh, all right. So now let's talk about play number three, create personal activity plans. This idea flows from our national search for innovation, specifically one of our winning schools, the Trinity School of Durham and Chapel Hill in North Carolina. When a student enters ninth grade there, they, well, when, when kids enter ninth grade period, they, they sit with counselors and chart an academic path forward across the country. Uh, at Trinity, they take the additional step of creating a four-year athletic plan. Students are asked what sports, if any, they would play, what sports and general fitness options might interest them at the school how those offerings might integrate with any non-school club sport activities they are involved with, or that robotics club that is of interest. We believe this simple innovation, call it a personal activity plan or whatever you like, doesn't really matter, holds great promise. Jez McIntosh is associate head of schools at the Trinity School and a former athletics director. Welcome, Jez. Why did Trinity introduce these athletic plans? Well, like many schools, we believe that athletics and school sports are part of the overall educational experience. And there are many lessons that can be learned outside of the class 
classroom through participating in sports. And so we wanted to be intentional to make sure we include everybody in uh, having access and opportunities to these life lessons that can be learned through sports. Mm -hmm. How have these plans helped different types of students, right? Because you've got some kids who come in who are really good athletes, other kids who maybe don't think of themselves as athletes at all. Um, how have they been useful to, to different types of kids? Well, it's helpful for, for uh, us to help plot out the four years of a student's life at, at, uh, on campus. So for the good athletes, we're looking at those who have realistic shots of playing in college or we're opening their eyes to the reality of playing in college. Um, we can plan off-season workouts or their, their map for four years. For kids who are just new to sports, we can introduce our non-cut sports. We can let them know of the teams that each season that we have that don't have cuts or but also by knowing the numbers of students who are actually want to participate, that helps us form new teams for new opportunities. And then um, it helps us on the school end, like I said, plan or start new activities or clubs or offering based on interests like disc golf or ultimate fris frisbee. If we don't have those teams, but we have 20 kids interested, we can then help support those programs. Right. Now you're a, you're a small private school. It's harder to introduce these plans certainly in larger schools. Any ideas though on how to do that? Sure, I would say, you know, start with looking at what you're doing currently. So if they're meeting with the counselor for their academics, just add on the bottom of the form three seasons of sport, fall, winter, spring, and see if that could be a quick, easy uh, introduction to these plans. Uh, or if you have a coding or an engineering class, have them develop a, a platform, a, a program that you can send out a survey and then the athletic department can review the data. Uh, you know, you could have also local school districts really um, beef up their counselors. We know the value of having school counselors uh, in schools. And so raise the minimum of counselors that are needed so that we can uh, sit down with these students and really be student centered in all of our offerings uh, at the school. Mm -hmm. What about philanthropy? I mean, can philanthropy take a lead in, in piloting this model within a maybe a geographic area of interest? Oh, definitely. I think there are so many people who would be willing, um, if they knew about the opportunities, to commit resources to providing access to students and opportunities because we know the benefits of athletics and physical fitness throughout the high schooler's career. Yeah, well, terrific. Well, thank you, Jez. Real appreciate it. Congratulations again on uh, uh, the national award. Thank you, Tom. All right. So now let's talk about play number four. Introduce other forms of play. This one's fairly self-explanatory. High school sports typically mean interscholastic sports with a fairly traditional menu of options. We're saying don't forget about intramural sports, which means classmates playing against classmates, and club sports led by students, and newer sports that are more casual, less costly, and promote physical activity. Let's talk with a couple of students who can help us understand what's possible. First, I'd like to bring in Avery B B uh, Bullioni. You're a senior on your uh, high school ultimate Frisbee team at Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. Uh, you've also previously participated in, uh, I believe, volleyball, soccer, and dance. Correct me if I got that wrong. Do I understand I you? Right. Yeah, I got that right? Yeah. All, right. <laughs> all those years of being a reporter, I guess we learned how to take notes. <laughs> Uh, but I understand that that ultimate is is your favorite. It is. It's my it's my main sport. I've been playing it since I was a freshman. Gotcha. Yeah. What do you love about it? Um, honestly, I really love my community. I think it's a very close knit, so you can't really get it anywhere else unless it's the ultimate community. I don't really know. I think it's just it's very close knit. Everyone knows each other, and you just it's like a family. <laughs> What do you see as like the uh, the value of introducing non traditional forms of play? Uh, I, think, I, I think it brings in a lot of different mindsets. So different types of people uh, go into these different types of sports, and I think it just brings in the diversity that you need in a community. So I think that would also bring out the non traditionalness that schools are impacted with, or that they need to impact. So. Right. And, and Ultimate isn't the only sport that does this, but um, what's interesting about Ultimate is uh, it, there are no referees, right? I mean, no. it's, it's students solving problems on their own, <laughs> negotiating 
results, right? I mean, where do you see the value in, in supporting, whether it be ultimate or any other other form of play where the students have that control as opposed to turning overall decision-making authority to, to referees and umpires? I think it brings in a lot that you'll need in your future, being able to make those decisions as a community and as a team, just knowing what the right decision is and um, knowing where you went wrong or where something could go wrong instead of listening to a referee and just being told what is wrong. So Got I it. think that's very important. Got it. Well, terrific. Well, thank you, Avery. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, now let's talk with Raiz Lopez. Uh, Raiz, you're a seventh grader, which is yes. great because the strategies in the playbook apply to middle schools as well. Now, I know soccer is your favorite sport, but I want to talk with you about sports new to you that were introduced through your school, specifically snowboarding. Snowboarding. What do you like about snowboarding, Raiz? Well, what I like about snowboarding is it's like it's a way to get out of L.A. or my environment. Like, my environment is drugs, prostitution, the yellow tape. And, like, I just feel stiff walking on the sidewalk, checking my shoulders. But when I go to Big Bear or the mountains, it just feels relaxed and I'm, like, I'm free. But when I go down the mountain, it's like I'm, like, flying and have a great time. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I hear you're pretty good, too. I hear you're a natural in the port. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, I mean, you learned about this, uh, about snowboarding through a PE program at your school uh, that introduces kids to action sports uh, like skateboarding, uh, surfing as well, um, with the help of a small grant from a national program that provides equipment, gear, lessons and transportation. Why do you think PE is a good way to introduce new sports to kids? Well, PE is physical education. So it basically educates you on your body, how it flows, what direction to go. And it also educates you on different sports. Like I didn't even know of rugby, snowboarding, or lacrosse. And I didn't really think it was fun until I actually tried it. And the environment I had was actually really fun. I want to keep trying it. <laughs> you know, it could be intimidating for kids to take up a new sport if they're not playing with their friends, right? If you're in a completely different group. I mean, how do you see that? I mean, how important is it to be with kids you know when you're trying a new sport like snowboarding or surfing or whatever else it may be? Well, I think it's very important to have your friends right there encourage you to do 100%, go after it. But it also creates a friendly, family, safe environment. And I want to give a shout out to Mr. Mendez my PE teacher, because he creates that environment, that safe environment. But he also wants me to be successful in life, and I'm really thankful of that. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. You're, you got a huge future ahead of you, Bray. So Absolutely. thank you for thank you for joining us today. Keep having fun with all those different sports. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about play number five now, which is develop community partnerships. This one's really, really core to the to the playbook here. It's hard for schools today today to be able to provide all the sports and fitness activities as that, that students may seek. On-site recreation spaces are limited, especially in charter schools like, like the one that Raiz comes from, uh, many of which move into small buildings that lack athletic facilities on campus. PE is rarely taken now after ninth grade in public schools and even less often in, in private schools. The smart move is to lean into community partnerships in all forms. Recognize that outside organizations often have the expertise, equipment, cultural competencies, facilities, and human capacities that school staff may lack. We've seen this happen to some degree with students with intellectual, physical, and other disabilities who often rely on partnerships with non-school organizations. Brett Fuller is a PE curriculum specialist at Milwaukee Public Schools and the past president of Shape America, which serves as the voice for PE and health teachers around the country. Welcome, Brad. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. What, what do you see as the value of this strategy? Well, especially in my role, uh, Milwaukee Public Schools partnerships is huge. We have a ton of community partnerships 
that are allowing our students to do things that we never, they wouldn't be able to do without it. For example, we have a um, mountain biking program through Milwaukee Recreation, but they got that through a community partnership with the Bike Collective. Uh, and so we've got high schools who have mountain biking teams now. That would never happen without that. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources does an archery tournament every year. We have teams attending that through our PE program, through that partnership with that, uh, that collaboration. So it, it's incredibly important to expand what we can do and to do what one of, many of the people said before, which is get outside of our schools. Our purpose is to get students physically active outside of the school day, so they'll do it when they're out of, out of high school. And so we got to introduce them to these, uh, these outside resources. Mm -hmm. You know, our national survey of nearly 6,000 high school students with resident education uh, developed a number of key insights and absolutely would encourage folks to take a look at that report as well. But one of those is that there is a strong demand for strength training programs and yoga programs, biking as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, so it really got us thinking with, with you know, PE being offered less often now, are there opportunities to partner with other entities in a community that focus on fitness? So it might be fitness clubs or otherwise where, you know, either their human resources or their or their buildings could be used to, uh, you know, schools can, can connect them or maybe even like with PE, uh, you know, maybe maybe you could get like PE credit in these clubs if they're following, you know, a particular curriculum. I mean, where do you see the possibilities with uh, fitness club partnerships. Those partnerships are incredibly important. We've got partners with a group uh, uh, of gyms that are through martial arts and boxing and the like that schools, they're working with them to come in, do some instruction alongside our teachers in our schools. We're working on a pilot on that right now. Uh, we have for years done work with uh, local yoga studios and instructors will come in and help our teachers uh, teach some yoga classes to get students excited about that. So absolutely. The challenge, of course, comes down to state statutes around uh, around credits because, uh, for example, in Wisconsin, to actually get physical education credit, you, it has to be taught by a physical education teacher. So mm -hmm. instead of saying they do it just because by going to the club, there has to be that collaboration between the physical education teacher and the outside entity to, to do that type of thing, at least within our state. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been fascinated with this idea of like, how to reposition the role of the PE teacher from just a pure provider of experiences to someone who knows the kids, but also knows the entities in a community that, that, you know, deliver quality programming. Almost like a PE is like a sport community sport chief. Of well, sort. and what I love about this is, you know, we have a summer school program uh, that we're trying to get it to our school year, but it works really well in the summer school program where it's a four week program and the students for the first four days of each week will do typical PE things, but the fourth day is a field trip to a community partner uh, who offers that type of activity. So we do disc golf. This one week we go down to our Bradford Beach for sandlot volleyball and fitness stations. Uh, we do go to a swimming uh, area. So there's it's a really fun activity, to, again, for that collaboration to get involved in. Yeah, well, terrific. Thank you, Brett, for joining us. Really appreciate the insights. And we'll be in touch with you as we move forward and develop some of these ideas. Thank you. So, all right. So now let's talk about play number six, bolster coaching education. You know, many high school coaches are amazing. Many also lack the knowledge to make sports a safe, healthy, and positive experience for students. Further, the requirements to coach are all over the map. Every state requires coaches to complete concussion training, and 92% of states require first aid and PR. But tr required trainings are a lot lower for sudden cardiac arrest and heat illness acclimation. Only six states require training in human development, developmental psychology, and organizational management. We Go to our website. You can see the state-by-state -state results from each. Um, Vince, Vince Manjaris is from Los Angeles, a former college basketball player who wanted to study coaching in a deep way, had to go to New Zealand to find a doctorate program and is now sport development officer for a prominent basketball club in Auckland where he has put his knowledge into practice. Welcome Vince. Good to be here, Tom. What is the, what's the value in your mind of just coaching education broadly? Well, Tom, I think what we have to really appreciate is that developing people through sport is hard work. 
Um, and it often comes down to the coach. You know, if you take some time and look through things like the Shape America's National Coaching Standards or the International Council of Coaching Excellence, you're going to see a list of a lot of competencies. And they range, you know, from uh, learning design to understanding motivation and adolescent, adolescent development. Then you throw in, obviously, your sports specific needs um, and, you know, what we mentioned about really knowing your community. I mean, that that's hard work. Um it suppose it's no surprise that that if you think about teacher education, it's a lot more intensive. Um, you know, teachers will go through multiple years of course of, of coursework. They'll have supervised field work before they enter a classroom. Um, you know, really properly full time. Um, and I think in for as a profession, you know, we we really need to stop kind of describing coaches as teachers if we're not going to prepare them and support them in the same way. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, as you know, many high school coaches in the U.S. are they're not teachers, right? They're people mm-hmm. from the community. So given the time constraints that these people are under and the lack of incentives to coach, usually the stipends are pretty minimal, a few hundred mm-hmm. bucks, maybe a couple thousand dollars. What's the appropriate ask of these coaches, these non-teacher coaches in terms of coach education? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that anyone who spent time as a volunteer understands that it's, it's a time poor field. Um, I do think, though, that um, those those of us who are in the field understand the value of developing people. And so for that reason, it makes sense to establish some uniform kind of common sense minimum requirements, particularly around, um, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, first aid, CPR. But I think that increasingly, you know, given the challenges around mental health, we really need to establish some um, minimum standards around physical, edu- uh, physical, psychological safety, um, and and that process needs to become um, more consistent, more standard. Um, we need to have less variation from state to state. Uh, we also need to increase, you know, adopt, uh, you know, standards over time, particularly around pedagogy and learning design. I think the second thing that's really crucial here is coaches need more support for on the job learning. You know, the education that we're talking about is not just formal education. It's the informal learning. It's the non-formal workshopping that happens, um, you know, periodically. And I think that that's where you're talking about a few very specific things like clear expectations, um, feedback in the form of observations and evaluations, uh, learning communities. We need to bring back this concept of coaches working together on their craft of coaching, whether it be um, a, a competitor, um, which happens here, we'll, we have competitors you know, learning together, but we also have coaches within across different sports within schools um, or within a region also working together. And I think that's something that we do see here in New Zealand that I, didn't always see in the U.S. when I was there. Um, and I suppose, you know, it would be nice to see roles like mine, uh, which, you know, I'm a coach developer. So my job is to literally work day to day on the ground with people. Gotcha. Well, good. Well, thanks for joining us, Vince. Really appreciate it. And really, your work as an advisor on the project. You've been terrific. You. You've been super engaged. You give us a lot Thank of you. ideas. Couldn't put them all in the report, but they're all terrific. And all right. Really appreciate your international perspective as well. On Thank this. you. All right, so now let's talk about play number seven, prioritize health and safety, okay? We like to think health and safety are priorities when it comes to the treatment of high school athletes, yet only one third of schools have a full-time athletic trainer and 31% of public high schools and 45% of private schools don't have any trainer, full or part-time. That's a problem. Athletic trainers help prevent and recover from injuries some of which can last a lifetime. They coordinate care and return students to games. They help with concussions, orthopedic injuries, eating disorders, heat illnesses, heart issues, weight management, diabetic episodes, and opioid and prescription drug abuse. They maintain a database of injuries and and treatments. We need creative solutions to get students the medical care they deserve. Joe Janowski is director of injury prevention programs at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Joe, welcome. Why is this play important to be included in the playbook? Hi, Tom. Uh, Thanks for giving me the opportunity to join you today. Uh, As you know, there are dozens of physical and mental health benefits associated with playing sports, but these benefits are limited by the risk of injury that come with being an athlete today. Experts uh, estimate that nearly 6 million kids suffer sports-related injuries every year in the U.S., and these injuries can impact children's health in the short term and well into the future, like you talked about. One example 
uh, ACL tears are among the most common knee injuries among high school athletes these days. And unfortunately, people who tear their ACL are up to seven times more likely to undergo knee replacement surgery later than life, later in life than uninjured people. So this play is really important because the health risks of playing sports should never outweigh the benefits. Yeah, well, I connect with that. My son, a high school athlete, and he's uh, recovering from his second ACL uh, surgery in a year right now. So what do we do about this, Joe? What are, uh, what are the potential solutions? Well, I think to be successful in prioritizing health and safety, the solutions have to be effective but they also have to be practical. They have to be things that can be implemented easily and quickly uh, by people on the ground in schools. And so, as you mentioned earlier, the playbook highlights this important role that athletic trainers play in the lives of high school students. Uh, they're invaluable, but delivering evidence-based injury prevention training for these high school athletic trainers, I think is one strategy that can help elevate this uh, health and safety priority. Gotcha. Beyond that, I think partnerships with local healthcare organizations can also help. People like sports medicine physicians, physical therapists, exercise physiologists, all of these folks can teach student athletes and their parents and coaches how to effectively reduce the risk of injury in the absence of an athletic trainer in the school. And, and Tom, lastly, health educators may be able to help here too. Collaborating with local and state health departments may be a really great cost-effective strategy that schools can use to promote the health and safety of their students. I think we can come up with even more that address this challenge if we work together collectively and, and make this a call to action. Yeah, you know, Hawaii is the only state in the country that mandates a full-time trainer in every school and pays for it. Um, what's the role of government here? Uh, there's certainly a role, and, and I, I think back to Carissa's remarks at the at the top of the event, uh, the the power that state associations uh, wield uh, in, in this in this health and safety realm is really important to consider. Uh, states can mandate specific trainings uh, for coaches, uh, for instance. So I, I think there's a, a significant role uh, at both the state and local level uh, to to prioritize. Uh, training, education, uh, and, and other forms of uh, information sharing that uh, people in schools can, can use to uh, protect the health of students. Mm, terrific. Well, thank you for joining us, Joe. And really, thank you to HSS and, and your team uh, for its long-term partnership and support of our work. Your commitment to injury prevention for youth athletes is baked into the DNA of Project Play and everything we do. So look forward to working with you as we help schools implement uh, implement this report. Likewise, Tom, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. We, we, we relish the role for sure. Absolutely. Okay, so finally, let's talk about play number eight, measure and evaluate programs. Look, many of the ideas in our playbook require resources. We recognize that. Given the strain that schools are under, it's easy to think we just can't do that now, but they can demonstrate impact to untapped funders, corporations, foundations, philanthropists, and government all recognize the need to address the major problems of our time, from rising obesity rates to economic divides to the assimilation of new immigrants. Some see sports as part of the solution, but they need the evidence of positive outcomes at scale to invest. So develop it, prove the value of sports, and tap into the half trillion dollars in philanthropic support that's out there. Corey Stevens is athletic director at Jennings County High School in North Vernon, Indiana, one of our school sports winners. Welcome, Corey. Thank you, Tom. Why do you think this play is valuable? I think it's extremely valuable uh, because it's really time for us to move beyond just wins and losses to measure and evaluate uh, programs. Uh, we need to find new ways to measure success. Um, in a win at all costs society, um, we need to find measures that don't ultimately focus on the result. Uh, it's much more about the process. Um, we're seeing examples every day of athletes, parents, and coaches 
uh, demonstrating behavior that is just harmful to sports and counterproductive, even at the, the youth levels. Uh, the focus needs to shift to relationships, experience, uh, experiences, and the positive lessons that are learned through sports, uh, no matter what the result ends up being. Mm -hmm. What type of information do you share, Corey, uh, with your sponsors? We try to um, tell the story of those positive um, outcomes as far as relationships, experiences, and lessons um, that are developed through our athletic programs and the relationships um, our student athletes have uh, with our coaches. We actually um, have moved away from wins and losses ultimately as a way of evaluating our coaches. Um, and again, we communicate that with potential sponsors and uh, you know, try to focus on uh, the outcomes that go beyond what's on the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. And what measures can schools use to demonstrate the success of their athletic programs beyond wins and losses? I mean, you've got a grid of like what, 20, 25 uh, uh, categories? Right? 20, 28 different categories. Um, we call it the deserve to win grid. And uh, we, uh, we use it as a planning grid to begin with before our coaches uh, start their season so we can sit down and address each of those areas. And then as an evaluation tool, once the season's over, to see if they were successful in each of those areas. Um, each of the 28 um, items on the grid are scored one through four or uh, not applicable is also uh, one of the, uh, the scores on there. Um, but it's everything from... Uh, you know, safety to how are we um, including alumni with the program? Um, how are we making sure that we're not discriminating? How are we uh, addressing leadership training? You know, all of those things that we think at the end of the day will result in, in wins for the program if they're they're being addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the question is how to like scale this. So, I mean, how can we this can be done on more than just an individual school level? And in the report, we talk about. Uh, uh, generally accepted standards of an exemplary high school athletics program uh, as identified by the High School Athletic Association in Connecticut. So getting very clear about what good looks like. How useful do you think that type of uh, state level uh, generally accepted standards are in, in, in organizing, uh, measuring and communicating um, positive results to potential funders? Well, I think that's a great way to address it. I think uh, the state associations, as it is, do a very good job of communicating um, these, uh, these things that go, again, beyond wins and losses. Um, but it really needs some teeth. You know, people need to buy into it and say, at the end of the day, you may have a losing record, uh, but what impact are you having on the kids and what lessons are they taking beyond their sport? Great. Well, that's terrific. Thank you, Corey, for all your ideas and innovation. Um, we'll be in touch as we move forward here. Thank you. Uh, now, yeah, absolutely. Great. great to have you. Now, I'd like to hand the baton to John Solomon on our team. John? Thanks, John. Great discussions. Uh, we're pleased to have with us now Najee Harris, who's one of the top young players in the NFL and an ambassador with Athletes for Hope. Before Najee became a Pro Bowl running back with the Pittsburgh Steelers, he grew up homeless. His family was evicted multiple times, bouncing around many shelters, and even living in a van. Najee, unfortunately, is not alone. It's estimated that 1.3 million K-12 students experience homelessness, accounting for 3% of public school enrollment. That's almost twice the number of homeless students more than a decade ago. For many of these students, as Najee learned, high school sports can provide a way to survive and thrive because sports are such a positive force. Najee, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, man. Thanks for the introduction. And it's uh, pretty cool. We didn't plan this, but you are at your old high school in Northern California today, which is cool in the background. Yes, How that, you... is not... <laughs> that was <Yeah>. not planned. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe your high school ex sports experience? What did you like most about it? And what, if anything, would have made it better? Well, yeah, so um, I went to, I'm went i from the Bay Area. I went to Antioch High School. Um, you know, my high school, my high school experience, you know, it, it was it was a lot of ups and downs. I didn't go to such like a powerhouse high school. You know, I went to high school where, uh, you know, not too many people actually go to the next level, I guess. You know, um, it's not a big school, not a lot of it's not the, the greatest, you know, um, school system either. Um, but, you know, I, I came here. Um, I was bouncing around a lot. So so I was even missing a lot of school. And then uh, 
I was supposed to go to De La Salle because my mom tried to put me in a good program, but uh, it ended up working out. I moved to this place called Antioch, and uh, I was like, you know, I wasn't on the border to go to that school. So I ended up going here. Um, you know, I came here like maybe like I missed five games of my senior year or my, of my, of my freshman year of uh, high school. And then uh, I played like one game on JV and then put me up on varsity. And, um, you know, I played against this other school with this other guy. Now he plays for the Bengals, the running back there. And you know, I guess I did pretty good against them. And then, like, uh, everybody was telling me to transfer. You know, you're not going to make it out here, you know. And, um, you know, I just, I just stuck through, through it. I met some good friends here, um, people who's all in my position, you know, who people I could, I could relate to. So, um, you know, I, I, I like to say I had a good experience in high school. I learned a lot. Right. You've, you've talked about publicly quite a bit um, that you grew up homeless. And, you know, homeless students are among the underrepresented populations that we've identified in our playbook that needs to be addressing. What, what types of challenges did you face, if any, uh, to play school sports? And how, and how did you overcome them because of your, your home situation? Yeah, so there was a lot of challenges um, I faced while I was homeless. Personal ones and obviously, you know, the, the most common one, and that's just being homeless, you know. Um, but, you know, just waking up um, and knowing not exactly what to wear. You don't really have that much clothes, have that much food, you know. Um, you got to really have much times where you can even take showers or stuff like that. Um, but, you know, just... Just the, and then, you know, personal issues of having the mindset like, you know, this is not something that I, w- I would like to like vocalize, or, like tell people about, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a person where, you know, I just want to feel no sympathy or I don't want to, I don't want nobody just to feel sorry for what I'm going through. So I'll keep all of it in me. Um, I didn't know how powerful, I guess, or how like, you know, life changing it could be to, to tell somebody like, hey, like I'm in your same position and I, you know, and I understand what you're going through. Um, and, you know, I'm here to say, like, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. So I didn't know how important that was at a young age. Um, so, you know, I just faced struggles of, you know, just keep it all in me. Um, I found that that was not the best thing to do is to keep stuff in you. Sometimes it's best to to vocalize your problems or, or just to speak about it. So, you know, it won't be all just bottled up in. And, you know, that create other issues and it could create other problems emotionally. Um, so uh, just problems like that, I guess. Um, you know, that's that's the main problems, I guess, that I faced. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I imagine there's a fine line between wanting to um, speak up and maybe ask for help, whether it's like from coaches or teachers or or teammates, and then feeling embarrassed about it, too. So, like, what what advice would you have to homeless students out there today? Like, who should they turn to for support within the school? Yeah. Staff? Yeah. So me, um, you know, like I said, I didn't really like to vocalize it, but, you know, it, it was one incident where, like, you know, I had to get dropped off at a, at a at my spot because I was staying in a hotel at the time. You know, I didn't want to tell my coaches that. That like, hey, like, you know, like, uh, you know, can you drop me off at this spot right here? And it was it was late at night. It's probably like after a game. So it's probably like 10 o'clock. So, um, you know, I I, I got like uh, I told my coaches they can drop me off and they, they drop me off at the hotel and they kept asking questions. I kept denying it. And then, um, you know, I built a relationship with my coaches where like, you know, I felt comfortable talking and, and venting to them about some stuff. Um, they was just in here, actually. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't just like. I don't just get comfortable with somebody like the first day. It takes me like a long time. So uh, it took about like a year or something for me to get comfortable with the coaches and my trainers. Um, then, you know, I start opening up a little bit more and then talking about it. And, um, you know, if I could say anything to any of the people who's going through, you know, housing issues or any issues, you know, it's just that, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. You know I mean? It, it seems very rough now, but, you know, in life, there's always going to be road bumps. There's always going to be situations where you have to get over. It's just part of life. You know, yeah, and, um, that's the best thing that's happened to us is, is facing adversity, especially at a young age, because then when you're facing it again, like it's not something new to you. It's not like something that, you know, what I mean, you haven't been through before. You just know that, like, you know, what I mean, this is just a, a small problem that I can that can overcome. So Absolutely. And, and how valuable was football to you in high school? Like if you didn't have football, do you think would you still have been attending school? Whether you would have more problems or what? What would that situation have looked like? If I didn't have football, I wouldn't be on a Zoom call. First of all, so let's just say that. Um, <laughs> uh, let's, let's, so football it helped me out a lot in a lot of ways. Of one, it, it helped me like you know, um, just get me off the streets. That's one. It helped me keep it clear in my mind out of what's going on at home or just around me in the environment. Um, you know, football helped me you know ex- expand and like you know make my name be bigger than you know, what I ever imagined it to be. Um, I get to go to certain events. I get to, you know, meet all these incredible people that I always looked on, looked up to and looked at on TV. You know, I'm on TV shows and stuff like that. So football opens up so many doors for me. Just being in sports opened up so many doors for me that I, I never really imagined it could do. 
um, you know, it puts me in a position now where I can help out other people, like people who are homeless or people who are, you know, going through domestic violence or anything. It, help, it helps me create, you know, I'm in position now to have, I have my own nonprofit now where I, where I help out homeless people. So, um, you know, Hobo opened up a lot of doors for me. That's right. And then there was another group of students we were talking about beforehand who don't play sports as much as their peers. And those are students with disabilities. And I understand that when you were in high school, you got involved in a lot of sports activities with, with some special education students. Tell us a little bit about what you did and, and why was that important to you? Yes, sir. So, yeah, so I, I want to get involved in, like, I, I'm always into helping people out. So um, I feel like, uh, you know, the special needs, you know, kids, they, they don't really get that much light shine on them. Um, I feel like they kind of just get like, in a way, pushed away, you know? So I feel like, you know, somebody like me and, you know, who has a big name people look up to, if I put myself in this situation and that sports volunteer as much as I can, then maybe we'll get a lot of light shed on, shed on them and give them more attention. And, you know, if they need to fundraise and, you know, people, like, they can raise money because they see me in it, you know, I, I, it will make people feel more comfortable, I guess, to, to say like, Oh, look, if Najee's doing that, then like, you know, why don't I, why, why, why can I do it? You know? So I want to, to be that person where, you know, I mean, we can, we can not like just turn our back of, or like just feel like they're belittled because, you know, they have special needs. I, I want to feel like, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're all human. We're all we're all in this together. And the, the most thing we could do is just help each other out. That's the least we could do is help each other out. So, um, you know, I, I, I try to vocalize that a lot when I was in high school. So I volunteered a lot of basketball, um, basketball events, special ed basketball, special ed track. Um, I got all the little pendants on my jacket, too. Uh, I have a, before I left high school, I got all these little pendants that I, I always talk about those first before anything else. Um, so, uh, yeah, man, I, I just try to get that vocalized a lot. That's awesome. Uh, last question for you. Our, our research shows that only about 39 percent of high school students play sports and only 23 percent receive the, the recommended daily physical activity that they're supposed to get. That means there's a lot of students not getting the educational, social, emotional, physical benefits, all the great things that come from playing sports. What's your advice to school leaders, you know, principals, coaches, ADs, whoever, on how to get more students engaged in sports? Well, you know, I feel like, you know, if you want more kids engaged in sports, uh, you should make the sport to be so like more fun, not like in a strict thing, in a strict way. I understand like for basketball, you got to make cuts and stuff like that. But, um, you know, just the fact that like if you promote the sport and promote it in other ways, maybe like of, like because like, I use sports of 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 kind of meditation or like, clear my mind or like getting away from things. So maybe if we use sports are like saying like, hey, like, you know, this can be another way of of maybe just, you know, clearing your mind out or, or, or letting go of like some anger. You know, what I mean, shooting a basketball or playing football, like some contact in a in a more professional legal way, I guess, you know, you could say not like doing it any any other ways. That's uh that will hurt you more. So I guess just. I don't know, maybe saying like, you know, this could be a, a way where you can clear your mind, I guess, <laughs> you know, maybe that'll yeah, help. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's so many different ways to play sports as well, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the varsity team, but we're also going to be talking, we talk about in our playbook intramurals and clubs and, um, and and just free play, even like PE. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I played all type of sports, especially PE. I love PE. Um, I didn't like the pacer test though, but yeah, I, I love PE though. I did, I did a, uh, you know, like just tennis, learning, learning tennis and, and, um, and all those things, you know, I want to be like an athlete in a way and just to, to, to guess, uh, specialize in all these sports. So, um, you know, doing the PE, I think is, is very huge, especially at, at a high school age, um, because, you know, you're kind of still finding out what you are in life in a way, you know I mean? You're still trying to find out, you might have some hidden talents that you never knew, you know what I mean? And then you might fall in love with one of these sports and, you know I mean? It might open up a tremendous amount of doors and opportunities that, you couldn't even imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Najee, thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us and, and thank you for the message that you're sharing, you know, through Athletes for Hope and, and all the work you're doing for, uh, for people who are homeless. Uh, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So for our final conversation, uh, we're going to talk about the main recommendation from this playbook, and that is tap the power of non-discrimination. 50 years ago, Title IX and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 opened doors for students from underrepresented groups by establishing that rights must be honored in the delivery of sport activities. Neither of these efforts has been perfectly executed, but the core idea that underpins each, that it's not okay to discriminate in the provision of education-based sports, provides a foundation to build a better model for addressing gaps in sports. Too many students are too easily excluded. For example, it's estimated that between six to 
of students with disabilities participate in high school sports, far below the rate of all students. And girls at heavily minority schools have only 39% of the sports opportunities as girls at heavily white schools. So we know the problems. We're going to talk a little bit about some potential solutions and what should best practices look like if high school sports were better viewed through the lens of non-discrimination. We're pleased to have three leaders here to discuss on this final panel. Uh, first, we have Deborah McFadden. She is president of Competitive Edge Management Associates, which helps people with disabilities access full inclusion in society. Under President George H.W. Bush, Deborah served as commissioner of the Administration on Developmental Disabilities of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She successfully sued a Maryland school district on behalf of her then teenage daughter, Paralympic champion Tatiana McFadden, to secure the right for students with disabilities to participate equally in sports. This led to passage of the Maryland Fitness and Athletics Equity Act and a federal mandate during the Obama administration. Next, we have Frankie Navarro. He is the Oakland Athletic Commissioner for the Oakland Unified School District in California. He's worked more than 25 years in high schools, including as a head baseball coach, athletic director, and dean of students. In 2019, he took over Oakland School Athletics as the district faced a major Title IX complaint. Facing a rush to balance its budget, the district cut 10 sports that dramatically affected more girls than boys. The district settled the complaint, and now it's Frankie's job to improve the sports opportunities and experiences of girls in Oakland. And Jimmy Lynch is Executive Director of Athletics for the School District of Philadelphia. He spent more than a decade as a teacher, coach, and athletic administrator at schools in Boston and Philadelphia. Jimmy serves on the board of the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association, and in 2020, he wrote a dissertation on how to build a successful model for school sports in urban schools. Thank you all very much for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, Jimmy, I want to start with you by talking about the current model in high school sports. It, it's very constrained. Um, roster spots are often going to the students who have played sports for a number of years, particularly travel sports. And that could be really expensive and leave kids behind. How do we change the mindset of high schools so every student, regardless of background or ability, has a right to play sports? Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. And, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Niehoff said it perfectly at the beginning of the uh, of the event and, and as well as some other guests. It's really just finding a way to to promote sports for for everyone. Uh, you know, as Tom was talking about, you know, a lot of it is kind of that interscholastic varsity athletics or, or bust and and really just trying to look at, you know, what can we pull from from other models out there through my research and, and other things that we've done in Philadelphia, uh, we started looking at what the, what the colleges, you know, any, any college institution rather, you know, they'll have their, their NCAA intercollegiate level. They'll have a campus recreation level. And then they'll oftentimes have an intermediate club level where you can really kind of tailor it to any student that's interested in playing, whether it's, you know, the full five, six days a week where they want to practice and play and, and compete for a state championship or if it's the kid that has, you know, to work three, four days a week and he's only got a day or two to to, to play, but he wants to use that time to, to play with his friends after school. So, um, you know, the models exist. They're out there. It's it's just really trying to get the stakeholders involved that that make those decisions to to, to understand that we want to reach more students, especially as we recover from the pandemic. Sports are going to play a critical role, especially in our urban communities as well. Frankie, uh, it's, it's one thing, of course, like check boxes and be compliant, you know, with laws and regulations, which, of course, are all needed. But it's another thing to be proactive and I think be intentional. What, what are your thoughts about how schools should intentionally create more opportunities for underrepresented populations? Yeah, thank you, John, for having me as well. I think um, one of the main things that what was said a bit earlier uh, in the conversation is really highlighting the, the value of participating sports and, and what it does for the culture and climate of the school. And so I think uh, for us here in Oakland, that's been a priority and in our training with administrators and working with our coaches is really to just highlight what it does for culture, school climate and school spirit and, and more so leaked over into pride in their self and their own community as well. So it's always important, uh, you know, to look beyond the checking boxes or, you know, doing this just because we want to be in compliance, but really, really want to do this because it's the right thing to do for students and the right thing to do to build community, uh, especially here in the city of Oakland, uh, where we're in high need to, you know, overcome some of the challenges that our students face on a daily basis. Yeah, so let's let's dive in a little bit into some of the, what, what best practices might look like. And Deborah, I want to start with you um, when it comes to students with disabilities. What should schools and families know about what best practices should look like for those students? I like your word when you said we, we need to be 
and we talk about purposeful uh, in our actions, that uh, it's easy to ignore students with disabilities. Uh, some of the schools sometimes just say, well, if we have to include them, let's let them play. Uh, I think they do with my daughter volleyball and put a, a balloon so she could do it. She's the uh, fastest wheelchair runner in the world. She just need a balloon to do that. But I think the schools and frankly, the parents are concerned. The parents have been focused on their kids uh, disability issue and they wonder, can my kids really play sports? So I do think the schools need to be a leader in saying sports is for everybody. And there are a number of communities, uh, partnerships that can be done. There are Paralympic sports programs um, throughout the United States that would be more than happy to come to the schools. Uh, you can find a list on Move United um, that does this. Um, but it's the fear, I think, that some of the schools have of what can I do? And they're so concerned about what is the disability, what I can and can't do versus what we should do for all students. Let's get you involved in sports. Let's make a partnership. Let's come up with something. And I I think about, you know, and they talk about then the expense. The expense, if the student is blind, you give them a piece of string to run with somebody. It doesn't cost anything for a piece of string. If you need to, to do volleyball, do sit volleyball. So there are creative ways that can be done, but I think the schools, rather than having a fear about it, have to reach out. And I like what Naji says, he goes, how can we possibly turn our back on a population that we're afraid of that doesn't do it? He said it so clearly, we can't turn our back. And the statistics, John, as you said, are abysmal, six to 20%. Yeah. Every kid needs to be involved in sports. When, when you say fear, explain that a little bit more, the fear of the schools. Is it fear of like liability? Is it fear they don't know how to coach a student with a disability? What, what do you mean by fear? I think the fear comes in a, in a number of ways. It's a fear of how, what do I need to know about the disability? It's fear about, will I hurt the student? Fear about what are the rules? The National Federation of High School Sports has a list of the rules. And some of the rules are are not so dissimilar to any of the sports. But also, the kids haven't been used to being involved in sports. So when you, we say to the kids, do you want to do this? Yeah, I think so. We have to have an adult stand up saying, I may not understand anything, but I am willing to try and I will seek out any resources to get it. So the fear of the unknown uh, can be easily solved. And the coaches are smart. The coaches figure out how to do plays all the time. Let's figure out how to do a play with a student who happens to have a disability. I will tell you my middle daughter is an amputee. She wanted to play uh, lacrosse and she doesn't need padding on the one leg. She's got a prosthetic leg and she didn't run up and down. And the school said, well, hmm, can we, is it okay not to pad her one leg? Really? It's a prosthetic leg, you pad so it doesn't hurt. Um, so some of them, it's just getting them to think through it a little bit and not being afraid about it's okay to ask. Some of the schools, can I ask that question? Of course you can ask that question. Um, so yeah. Yeah, J Jimmy, I mean, what, what's your approach to students with disabilities and, and which comes first for like a school? Should it be the school needs to reach out to, the, uh, to that population, right? And understand who their population is or is it up to the families and students to go seek out um, these opportunities from the school? Yeah, it's, it's very similar to what Frankie and Deborah have, have both talked about. It's, it's about being intentional. So there's two there's two folds. One, you want to make sure your coaches are properly trained in inclusive practices. So whether that's uh, students with with intellectual disability, physical disability, whatever it may be. One thing we've done in Philadelphia is we require all of our coaches to go through the NFHS Learn Coaching Center, and they all have to take the Coaching Unified Sports course. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, as well as just kind of going through regular professional development. And then the other piece is you – you know, it's, it's very easy to say, oh, well, if we have any students with disabilities that want to play, we will we will make room for them. But you don't want it to come off like that. You want to make sure that you are reaching out to those populations who so, were not, you know, not usually included in scholastic sports. And again, going back to the different levels, it could be an interscholastic level. It could be a club level. It could be, you know, working with them and encouraging them to participate in intramural programs. Again, it's it's and I think Frankie pointed this out earlier. It's all about the participation. We want kids playing. Uh, no matter what level it's at, they're going to get a benefit from it and they're going to associate a positive experience with their school, which ultimately will impact their student outcomes in the long run. Yeah. Hey, John, just a comment on that. So I think some of the schools don't know. Um, I work with the uh, 
high school students seeking to go on to college, the amount of athletic scholarships that are out there for students with disabilities is amazing. Uh, a number of these kids that I'm working with, they're getting $100,000 to go to school, $100,000 to go to college out of state. They need to have the ability to participate in sports. And then they're going to these great universities. And I think a lot of the coaches aren't aware of it. They are becoming more aware of it when the student says, hey, by the way, I'm signing for this university because we have a signing ceremony. And what we're hearing is you get to sign for it, a college. If they can't participate, they can't get these scholarships. Absolutely. Frankie, another population um, that uh, is underrepresented when it comes to participation is girls. You've gone through your the Title IX complaint uh, here in recent years in Oakland. Um, what are some of your biggest takeaways about how to create a more positive sports experience, both that's it's got to be attractive to girls and also following federal law? Yeah, so for here, um, one of the big you know, challenges of me when I first took over this position is obviously identifying where areas of growth were for our, our league and our section. Uh, and really what it took was a grassroots effort of not just conducting a survey and sending it out, but really visiting schools and talking to the girls' population, talking to students. And I was able to get an understanding of what their need were, and which was you know, the, girl, the sports that they were asking that were not available at the schools. Uh, so big takeaways was, you know, just really having student voice at the center of our decision making of how we add uh, sports. And then the next piece was also just making sure that we reevaluate everything that we do across the board to make sure that the girls are also getting the same opportunities as our boys. Uh, the next piece also that was a big takeaway is really just also analyzing our coaches and ensuring that we're reaching out to more women coaches. Um, in our league to ensure that they, you know, are also creating more comfortable environments. And so those are some of the things that definitely were at the forefront of, of the work. Uh, we've also partnered with community organizations that were already doing, uh, you know, programming for girls and being able to bring them in as a support method. But ultimately, just, you know, just ensuring that our girls have the same access, the same experience um, and, and more so are also planning specifically for our girls sports. I think it's an important point you mentioned about experience, because I think a lot of people sometimes think, OK, Title IX compliance is just equitable student participation numbers by gender. But it's more than that. Right. I mean, so what is Oakland doing or looking at for girls regarding, say, athletic facilities or practice competition times or publicity or transportation? Because a lot of times those other amenities oftentimes favor boys. Yes. Yeah, so just, you know, to answer your question directly, there's there's a number of things that we're doing right to, to ensure uh, the fundraising is equitable. Our, our roster management um, and, and how we're adding teams is, is looking at is also equitable on a school to school basis. When facilities, one of the challenges that we had, uh, many of our schools were built uh, in the 60s and prior to. And so the the just the the way the facilities were designed were not you know adequate and it was very different for boys and girls. But there are, you know, adjustments that we've had to make as far as who has access to certain rooms. And so we've done a complete district evaluation of all of our facilities uh, to be able to submit for our building, buildings facilities district leadership as we begin to plan moving forward for any facility uh, improvements and, and capital uh, projects that, you know, the the voice of girls and what is needed for our girls sports is at the forefront of, of our planning. So. Uh, yes, we've had to look at, at a number of different prongs approach under our Title IX compliant process. But uh, like I said, the end result has been that we've learned uh, where we need to make the adjustments, you know, what we need to provide. Uh, the biggest takeaways has been there is, you know, as far as benefits that are provided for our sports for girls and boys. We've been able to create a uniform ordering cycle that will guarantee us being in compliance uh, league wide to district wide for all of our schools over the next several years. So uh, those are just a couple of the things that we've been working on. Yeah. And Jimmy, it's easy to say, as we do, that we want a model that's more inclusive, that's focused on non-discrimination. But the reality, unfortunately, is that doesn't always happen, right? People get set in their ways. They get stretched thin. They decide it's just not important enough. But who are the key actors to improve this model, to like make it clear to schools that, look, no, non-discrimination in sports has to be really important. Yeah, it starts with with leadership. So uh, I know um, with Paolo earlier with the state boards of education down to the local superintendents, uh, you know, local gover uh, government officials, uh, it really takes kind of a, a lot of people to come to the table. And 
Um, you know, Title IX obviously is one of the biggest ones, and we're celebrating the 50th anniversary this year. Um, but you know, there's a there's a big difference between you know saying that you're in compliance with Title IX and saying you're committed to what Title IX stands for, and, and that's really important because it's very easy to say, oh, you know, we're you know we're we're building a new uh, locker room for the football team, so we're going to do it for the field hockey team instead of saying, hey, we're going to look at how we distribute our facilities, how we distribute our access. To all of our programs uh, goes back into the obviously any students who have disabilities as well, making sure it's accessible. Um, so, you know, one thing that we've taken apart uh, in the time I've been at, at, at our school district is anytime we replace a field, we make sure it's lined for field hockey, for girls lacrosse, for boys lacrosse, for soccer, for football. That way, anyone has access to it and there's no barriers that are there. Same thing with gymnasiums, making sure it's lined for volleyball and badminton as well as basketball you know, which volleyball and badminton are two of our, our primary female sports in the district. So again, it's it's a fine line between saying you're in compliant with the three prong approach that Title IX puts forth, but it's also another thing to say that you're committed to what Title IX stands for and, and the Disability Act and making sure that what you are putting out there and how you're running your programs is to ensure accessibility as well as opportunities for all. Yeah, and, and Jimmy, you talked a little bit earlier about the college model. Um, so explain that a little bit more and, and what role could state high school athletic associations play with that? Like is how do their rules and policies impact whether you can have some of those programs? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of state associations essentially, um, you know, if we're in their bylaws and constitutions, they put forth that if you're going to host a sport uh, that is one of the sports that they sponsor, it has to be held to all their standards and bylaws, which includes, you know, when you can play, how long you can play, all that kind of stuff, where uh, if there, if we took a, a page out of the college playbook and we have the NCAA, don't get me wrong, we're still going to have our varsity interscholastic program. That's, you know, that's never going to go away. You're still going to have your Friday night lights and all that kind of stuff. But if there was, uh, you know, schools throughout your district or at, throughout your state that maybe couldn't compete at that level, whether it was they didn't have uh, enough students to participate or they didn't have the skill or whatever it may be, um, you know, you, you're able to kind of build a, a, a less, not, I don't want to say a, a more developmental model, if you will, um, still be able to play against other schools, but, you know, maybe kind of, you know, use a little uniqueness in how you do it. Maybe you can't field 11 man football um, and you can't really compete in a, a 15 week long season. So you're looking to kind of do maybe a six, eight week season similar to what intramurals is, but still play against the other schools that are around you, especially in urban communities where schools are so uh, so densely populated and, and, and concentrated in geographic areas, you know, it, it would allow more of those students who have external barriers, whether it's, you know, commitments to to help out uh, with the family at home or commitments to to work or whatever it may be that can't commit those um, those practice days and game days week in and week out. Um, but again, they still want to have fun with their friends and they still want to have that joy of participating in, in an after school sport opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, thank you all so very much. We really appreciate it. Jimmy, Deborah, uh, Frankie, thank you for joining us. Um, and that's a wrap for our event. Uh, we really appreciate everyone joining. Uh, we hope that the strategies from the playbook will be useful to you and to school leaders across the country. Uh, as a reminder, you can read the playbook. Uh, you can use your phone by using this nifty QR code or visit as.pn backslash playbook. Uh, please share with others to help grow the awareness. Uh, every child deserves the right to play sports and be physically active. Big thank you to our uh, funding partners, Adidas, Box, the Dick Sporting Goods Foundation, and Hospital for Special Surgery for supporting this two-year project. They provided $160,000 in awards to eight exemplary high schools. If you like one or more of the ideas in the playbook and you want to partner with us to implement them, please reach out to us by emailing sportsandsociety at aspeninstitute.org. Don't forget that the Project Play Summit is almost here. It'll be May 4th at Audi Field in Washington, D.C. The nation's premier event for leaders building healthy communities through sports is back for the first time in three years. And attendees will receive a free hardcover copy of the school sports playbook and hear additional sessions related to high school sports. Tickets are going fast, so buy yours now. You can visit as.pn backslash ppsummit22 to register and see the full agenda. Last but not least, special thanks to Sabrina, Jennifer, and Marty from our Aspen team for their support behind the screen, the scenes. Uh, we don't pull all this off without uh, their support. Thank you all very much for joining us um, and have a great day.